What I think has happened in the West is that take, they have taken that portion and turned it, turned it upside down and tried to claim that this is the human being, that we're the rational animal. And I say no, that's not, that does not reflect my experience in the world. And if, I'm, if, I'm a, if a human being is defined as a rational animal, then what was I before I had a rational mind? What's a baby? When do you become human, for example? So I think that we need a, a great review of a lot of things, but that's not really... Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, an interesting person in this, an interesting person in this area is uh, Martin Heidegger, I think. How do you break free from it? Uh, I mean, for the religious person, you, you break free from it through experience of the divine. And how do you get, how do you get into that, that time zone? Because these, this is called the day, the, uh, like Allah says in the Quran, remind them of the days of Allah. So Allah's time and Allah's days are different than this, what we're experiencing. And a person can literally step into the, to that time by being in God's presence. How do you know when you're in God's presence? Because you don't conceive or perceive of anything else. And that's the, that's the greater uh, capacity of the human being. Yeah. I just need to go back to the so friends said want to do in Parliament, spend a couple of years there and you'll find the answer. Maybe. Enlightenment, that's what that's after. That's what it could be so through Dan mm. Dan was about. Well, I mean basically what it is is returning to returning to where you came from. You know, you're just returning to where you came from. Because you and I came from a place wherein this wasn't happening. And we are in this realm for a short period of time, and we will return back to eternity. And once we return, return back to eternity, we will endure the rest of eternity based upon how we were in this world. In other words, the state of my soul enduring through this world will determine the, the state, its state in eternity after this world. And there's arguments, if you don't believe all of that, there's arguments for all those kinds of things, but just to answer your question quickly. The idea is to, go, the idea is to get back home. So, but then we have to love to rush back home by committing suicide. Huh? But then we have to love to rush back home by committing suicide. No, the reason why that the reason why a person isn't rushing back home by committing suicide is because they're not rushing back to the source. They're not rushing back to the source. They're, they're so preoccupied with the effect that they just want the effect to end, but they're not thinking about the cause. That's a, that's a difficult, that's a difficult discussion because people get into certain states. Not, you know, don't, don't want to judge people for what they do in their life. But in the end, they were so preoccupied with the effect that it caused them to forget about the cause. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for a thing which enters into time and space. So imagine now, this is the, the time-space line. Again, this is... Well, I'm, putting, I'm putting a line down the middle of our room. This is before time and space. This is after time and space. For a thing which enters into time and space to exist on its own. So in order for it to go through this part of the, its journey, it would have to have brought itself into time and space before it existed. In other words, to be able to continue movement through time and space, requires the same thing that brought it from non-existing to existing. It's impossible for it to do it there, so you better believe it's impossible to do it here. This is, to suggest that it can do it here is absurdity. It's absurd. So therefore, no thing exists on its own. We can say that. No thing exists on its own. Existence, in other words, means movement. Nothing is moving on its own. Nothing exists by its own. 
in order to maintain its existence, it would have to sustain an activity it could not do in the first place. As I said, bring itself into existence. So, in its creation, in its jumping from here to here, and in its sustenance every moment of its life, that thing which brought it into existence and causes it to go throughout its life has ultimate power over all things. Ultimate power is in the hands of that thing. When I say that, what I mean is this. In order for me to have water, that mover, that entity that brought me into existence has to be there. In order for me to have movement, it has to be there. In order for me to have will, it has to be there. Power, it has to be there. Sight, seeing, knowledge, any quality, any attribute whatsoever. And even for myself to exist in the first place at all. For us to be able to sit here and to talk to each other, to have an exchange, to have language and communication and thoughts and ideas, to be experiencing life whatsoever, to even have the prerogative of being able to have a problem. <laughs> Many of us are complaining about our problems and saying, oh, you know, uh, my life is terrible, this happened to me and that happened to me and this happened to me and that happened to me. But do we remember that in order for me to be able to even to complain about those problems, I have to, be, I have, to have been given life in the first place. And the one who is causing each one of those events to come into, in other words, those events, the things that I like and the things that I don't like, those events and everything that's inside of them, that entity that brought them into existence has to be with them through, the, through their lifespan. In other words, to bring it down to earth, when you are happy, when you are sad, when you are up and when you are down, when you feel like worshiping and you don't feel like worshiping, when you're confused about God, I'm not confused about God, when you're, when you're in a state of, of, uh, of peace or in a state of war, whether externally or whether internally, whatever occurs in the time and space continuum, those things are all movements and all movements have to be moved. Is it true or not? So the question I have to ask you then is, can God abandon me? If God abandoned me, Forget about me as an entity. If God abandoned this, this cup, what would, what would happen to it? Wouldn't it would completely disappear. Not only would it disappear, but its memory would disappear from everyone's minds. If God abandoned this table, if God abandoned the chair, if God abandoned the one sitting in the chair, so I'm asking you, can God abandon me? Is it possible for God to abandon me? And the answer is no. So then where do the feelings of, where does, where does abandonment come from? I asked you, do you have you ever felt abandoned? And only a few of you raised your arms, and I guarantee you, everyone would raise their hands if no one else was looking at them. It, it, is, it, is, intellectually, it is intellectually impossible for God to abandon me when we consider everything that we've just talked about. So why is it happening to us? It's our ego. It's the mind and the body taking it. I think the question is, have we abandoned God? That's the question. And that's exactly where I'm going. The question is, who's abandoning whom? We are far away from the being. We don't have knowledge. Knowledge equals love. Love God. We're coming from and from away from it. In other words, to put it into more like kind of you know, secular terms, the only abandonment that's actually occurring, I think, is myself. But even myself, I cannot abandon God. Why can't I abandon God? Because He's necessarily existent. My mind won't let me. My mind will not let me. Unless I can explain a different, a different reality. My mind will not let me. So let's talk about abandonment then. Who's abandoning whom? Can God abandon me? It is intellectually and spiritually impossible for God to abandon me. Well, then why do I feel like I'm being abandoned? Well, you said, well, I'm the one abandoning God. But the truth is that I'm not abandoning God. It's an emotional thing. Well, what's really happening? No, no, what's really happening? I think the life experiences No, 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 what's really happening? What's really, 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 really happening? Get to the bottom of it. <laughs>
as I sat here in this room and I tried to delicately sort of go through the different steps, there wasn't anyone showing any objection. It might be because most of us probably believe in something anyway. But for the sake of the conversation I was sitting here, no one showed any objection. Yeah. No, that, that's where we're going. Right now, when we're sitting here in this room, no one found any objection to the things that I was saying. It was almost like I was just reminding us, if we weren't thinking about it, what we already know. It doesn't, it, you're not putting a square peg into a round hole. But what has happened to us? What is, number, number one, God is not abandoning me. It's impossible. I'm not abandoning God. It's impossible. He necessarily exists. What is really happening? What's really happening is something simple. I'm, I, I, I have forgotten. I have forgotten. I have forgotten. And when you hear someone tell it to you again, you remember. But clearly, I have forgotten. And that's why in the Quran, Allah says, Nasullah fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot God, and God caused them to forget themselves as a result. I don't seem to understand that I have a necessary relationship with God, necessarily speaking. Whether it's in the physical realm, in the spiritual realm, in the psychological realm, I have a necessary, a necessary relationship with the creator of the world. But the thing is that I'm not thinking about things in ultimate terms. I'm caught up in the life of the world. And so what am I doing? I'm busy thinking about the notches. And since I'm just, I've fixated on these moments, I've forgotten the big picture. This is what, this is what happened, this is called the life of the world. I have to do the life of the world causes you to forget what you already know. So when you go to God at the end of all of this and you're sitting there talking to Him, He's not going to tell you something you didn't know. But what has caused me? What has caused you to be deluded about your Lord? Why do I have these misgivings? What has happened? It's simple, man. Out of sight, out of mind. Is the, the word insan uh, seems to the word forget? Yeah, that's true. But that's not an excuse. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like we do that, we don't fall into it, but the question is this. Why am I not motivated? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm asking this question for myself to you, as one of you. Why am I not motivated? What has caused me to be, to settle? What, why am I so in love with these things? Has it, has it ever done anything for me? You know, people go on and on about food, about cuisine. I don't really care myself. Why? I have never tasted anything whose taste never went away. The best food in my life, the best coffee I've ever had in my life was in Italy. It was in Milan. I remember it very well. I'm a coffee fanatic. It was great. You know, it was like one of these kind of like sort of brass looking contraptions with the steam coming all over the place and the dials and like it was, it was like a laboratory. And it came out like, it was like black gold. Right? The milk was perfectly prepared. It was, I'm telling you, it was the best cappuccino I ever had in my life. I, I still remember the taste, kind of. I remember, I remember the experience. But I'm telling you, as soon as I finished that cup, and I did it in about 20 seconds, it's like water to me. It's gone. It's gone. The clothing that I wear, the things, that, how long do they last for? The person that you love, the people that you fall in love with, how long are they there for? What is it? Why do we cling to these things? What is it about them that causes us, what is so necessary about them that we cling to them in the first place? We've said, these are, look, we said these are all possibilities. They're just possibilities. You can get some money, you lose some money. You get a wife, you lose a wife. You have a child, you even lose children. Something good happens to you, it doesn't last forever. Bad happens too. Why am I chasing these things? What, I mean, like, seriously, I'm asking you from a conceptual level, like, what is going on? Like, why? Why am I spending all my time chasing after what just is going to come and go? When I know this is necessary, this must be. And I don't even bother with this. So to make it simple, I got two things going on. This is it. This is all you have. This is all you have. 
if this is the most important? How? Get a good education, okay, then what? Get married, okay, then what? Get a house, okay, and then what? Have some children, okay, and then what? Retire from your job, okay, and then what? Get old, okay, and then what? Lose all your hair, okay, and then what? Use your, use your teeth, it's great. Limbs start falling off. <laughs> right, get ready, because we're going into the grave. And this is why people are so unhappy, because all you're showing them is mere possibilities, and people want facts. They want what's real. This is why people are so depressed. And don't think that, like, you know, don't think that, oh, you know, I'm talking to the Muslims, right? Like, don't think, oh, mashallah, I'm going to start practicing deen, and I'm going to go to the mosque, and everything's going to be wonderful. It's not going to be wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it's not going to be wonderful. Why? Because you're still dealing with the possibilities. It doesn't matter if you're praying five times a day. Good, that's what God commanded you to do. Fine, that's great, but that's still not the necessary. What does God have to do with it? What does God have to do with your religious experience at all, if you even have one? What does He have to do with it? But isn't it not the manifestation of your relationship with God through those actions? Listen, man, I'm telling you the truth. For example, there's a verse. That says, or at least that says, we have beautified these things of life yeah. so that you may enjoy through halal provisions. I'm not talking about, look, I'm not, I'm, not not on this, I'm not on this trip about go to the cave and just forget everything. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this. When you go to the Jummah Khutbah on Fridays, how often do you hear about necessary? Probably from the first word? No. I didn't say mention him. I'm talking about when do we talk about him? When does he become the thing that our hearts are gazed upon? When does he become the subject of discussion? When does he become the, the thing that we adore and we're devoted to? I'm not talking about saying. I can say zebra all day long. Sorry, zebra. Mm -hmm. but for example, zikr, the, the, the act of zikr in itself. If you don't know the one you are remembering, if you do not know the one you're remembering, if you don't know the one you're remembering, how is it remembrance? But if you do know them, if you don't, but if you do know, them. no, stop, stop. If you don't, do you know Allah? We all try. Do you know Him? That's the yes or no? Yes. Tell me how you know Him. Through the Scripture. No, that's Scripture. Do you know Him Himself personally? Through the Scripture. Do you know Him yourself? Have you experienced God's presence? Well, yes. So how? Well, again, through Scripture. I'm not asking you about books, man. I'm asking you about your life. <laughs> but ultimately, we are limited, as you said. I'm asking one. you, do you know God? Yes or no? Yes, I think I, think I do. How? Well, that, we're going back to that circle. So okay. We'll through the scripture. Fine, fine, fine. Otherwise, experience is an individual. Okay. An individual scripture is very good. If you tell me how many, if you tell me, for example, tell me the taste of honey. What does honey taste like? In the words that we would use, yep. you and I are probably sweet. Okay, chocolate is sweet. So you're telling me that honey is chocolate? Yes, but then we're limited is to Is honey the chocolate, chocolate, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is? No, no. Okay, so is, now tell me, describe to me what honey tastes like. Well, we're you're talking to me, let's just make sure that we're looking at this from the. I love you, by the way, there's no problem. I just like this. Look, these are words, okay? These are words. Sweet. Uh, God. Okay, these are words you'll find on a piece of paper. I'm not asking, first of all, I want you to try to understand, I'm not even asking you about this, but I'm going through this exercise to help you show that I'm not talking about this. Um, here's another word. I come across this word in a book, and I want to know what honey is. What would I do? Go to Morrison's and get a job. Go to Morrison's and get a jug of honey. That's not it. enough. I can't look at the thing and know what it is. Then what do I, I do? To taste it. I have to taste it. Yeah. Once I've tasted it, am I going to be able to tell you? Raise your hand in this room if you've, if you've had honey before. Oh, oh, I thought you guys are so quiet. I thought there's no honey habits. Someone help this poor brother <laughs> because I'm just attacking him. 
help him out and tell him and describe to me what honey tastes like so that I can know. Because what he's telling me is, is that if I read descriptions or read texts, it's the same as the reality. No. Well, that's what he's saying. Yeah, I know. So I'm asking you to, to, to I'm asking you, well I have an example of when that's not yeah. the case. It's called honey. It's like being thirsty and having a bottle of water. You don't know what it's gonna feel like to drink that water. You can't do it until you feel it and you bloody know it. Sorry. It's an everyday word. <laughs> um, unless uh, you can't know it unless you taste it and it becomes part of you. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. You're telling me that you know God. Fine. You're telling me that you know Him through Scripture. I'm having a difficult time with that because Scripture is not the same as reality. Yeah. It's not the same as experience. Yeah. Example of that is when it comes to honey. You can't even tell me accurately on paper in such a way that I'll understand what honey is. But I'm like, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, it's fine. If you know God, then tell me about Him. Does anyone know God in the way that that can justify the existence of God? Yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. Who does? Those who know? Yeah. <laughs> well, Wait. Yeah. Does anyone in this room have any experience when it comes to honey? Does anyone in this room can you just can you justifiably say that you know honey? Yeah. Raise your hand if you can. I think wait, wait, raise your hand if you can, one step at a time. No, I wait a second. <laughs> if you've tasted honey, raise your hand. Okay, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room can verify that honey is real. Yeah. And they know honey, mm -hmm. intimately speaking. Mm -hmm. Because of what? Based upon what? Based, not you, you. Yeah. Based upon yeah. what? Yeah. Say the word. Yeah. Say the yeah. word. Yeah. Thank you, God. <laughs> This means that true knowledge is what? Experience. True knowledge is experience. It doesn't have to be something that's verifiable. Wait a minute. This is the problem with the Western mind. And this is the problem when it comes to the categories of the mind. Oh, forget about it. We don't believe anything until you can put it on paper. But look, man. Love, for example. Is love a rational experience, yes or no? Yeah. It's entirely irrational. Why in the world, right? Like, if you, like your wife, for example, like, why do you love this lump of flesh as opposed to any other lump of flesh? It makes no sense at all. It's irrational, it's non verifiable, but yet it happens. So, what am I talking about? When I'm talking about knowledge, this is exactly my point that what we have done is simply limited knowledge to a, a series of definitions and texts. That's not knowledge. That's knowledge is experience. That's also somebody else's experience of you if you're going to go just by scripture and everything. I else. don't need everybody on the earth to be able to tell me that God is in order for him to, in order for him to is. I don't need everyone because, because I don't need everyone on the face of the planet that takes honey to know that honey is whatever it is. Yeah, I agree. This is not knowledge is not something that experience knowledge, experience, these kinds of things. So what I'm asking about is What has happened to our religious experience that has divorced us from the idea of experience? The true connection. The true connection. Why am I why am I subject? Why do I think this is this is why do I think this is what it's about? This is Quran. Don't need it. No, you need it. Wait a second. This is Quran. But if you think that this is Quran, you're off your rocker. Mm. Why? The Mus'haf, for example, there's the Quran and there's the Mus'haf. The difference between the Quran and Mus'haf is clear. The Mus'haf is the book. Now, this is not one of them, but I'm giving you a visual aid. The Mus'haf is the book in which you find the letters on the page that people call the Quran. That's not Qur'an. The Qur'an are the meanings that have descended into, that are represented by letters that are on the page. In other words, what's happening is that most of us, we're just reading letters on a page. That's what I meant when I said you don't need the Qur'an. You do need the Qur'an as a guidebook. But, I mean, nobody told me about the, the Qur'an, but I knew that God and, and 
Islam, that, all, the, all the things that go with it. But long before I read the Quran, the Quran just just puts it down yeah, on the verifies. table. It verifies. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. It verifies for Thank you. Yeah. That's what I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I understand what Please, you're talking about. Cool. I'm with you too. Cool. Good. All right. cool, so, so wait, so wait. Now, here's the thing. There's something really amazing about this point, I think. And that's the, look, man, you might, and I might, and everybody in this room might have connected with lines on a page. But that's not Quran. The Quran is the meanings which the lines indicate. And those meanings only mean something when you have what then? Experience them. Otherwise, there's nothing but what? Lines on a page. It's nothing but a, in words, nothing but a, a movement. And I, and I ask you to ask yourself, when was the last time you prayed so lot and actually thought about God? And when you thought about Him, did you think about Him in the way that He is, or think about Him in the way that you imagine Him to be? Because once you've had an experience, you can't do that anymore. So we're talking about two different things right now. Can God abandon me? The answer is absolutely no. But if that's not something I'm going to be able to get from this, man, none of this is going to be able to answer that question for you. Your mind might be able to see my point. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. That's wonderful. It's not going to mean anything until, what, you've experienced the truth. To experience the truth, and I mean, this is the, the problem, the, the problem that my final point before I open up everything is that the, the prop, the, the, what I see is that being a, being a major battle, a major trial amongst the Muslims, specifically, is that we have been given a tradition that is intact. For the last 1400 plus years, we have a tradition that is intact. If you ask me, why do you pray the way you pray? I will say, because my teacher taught me, who taught their teacher, who taught their teacher, who took from so-and-so, who took from Malik, right? Who took from the, the <coughs> man behind him, and the man behind him, and so the Prophet built the oh. I know why I pray the way I pray. If you ask me, why do you speak, why do you read Quran this way? I will say because of so and so and so and so and so and so. If you ask me these questions, I can tell you why. If you ask me, why do you pray five times a day and not four times a day? I will tell you why. If you ask me uh, about anything to do with my physical activities, I can tell you where they go in terms of the categories of life. Can you do it? Can you not do it? All that stuff is great. You don't find any other tradition on the planet that's like this. They don't, for example, and there's no offense to anyone here who has a different tradition, I'm just saying the Muslims are very particular. For example, when it comes to Jesus, do you know how, pardon me for saying it, but do you know how Jesus relieved himself? <coughs> is it that detailed? No. Do you know what he looked like? Vaguely. Man, this tradition is out of control. We know all these things. But that becomes a double-edged sword. Because I become what? I become content. I become content with a tradition. I become content with the tradition. I become obsessed with the tradition. I become, my iman goes into the tradition. My faith goes into the tradition. My everything goes into the tradition. Until the, until the tradition becomes what? You know what I'm saying. Steel box. No. Tradition becomes God. God. That's what God's, God's not to do with tradition. No, it's not that it has nothing to do with tradition. It's that the tradition is there to show you, to point to God. Yeah, but I mean, but well, what happens is this, that we feel, we feel content. I pray five times a day. Oh, good job. I fast. Oh, good job. I pay as a cop. Oh, that's a good job. I make hajj. I make hajj every year. Oh, you did a good job. <laughs> What does any of that have to do with God? Nothing. What? Well, you kind of start to wonder. You kind of start to wonder, because if you can tell me about all of this, but you can't tell me about the one it's for, I'm sorry. Something is badly, badly wrong. That's where you get people like Westerners, like myself. I'm not saying I'm more wonderful, but I mean, not me. I know nothing about that. How did Muhammad used to be a problem to drop it? How did he know until he was... I mean, he put down, it was put down on paper, the Quran. But he knew instinctively about Allah before. I mean, he, he's like me, he couldn't read, couldn't write. How do I know? You just know, it's a gut thing, you know, it's there. 
You like this talk, huh? Yeah, I like it. I like you too, so what? I like your beard. <laughs> She's not concerned about the dog. They're concerned about the owner of the dog. Because if you're sitting there talking to the dog, hey, little guy, don't eat my face off. <laughs> Dog's like, I like when you jump around. You're tastier this way. <laughs> but if you talk to the owner, if you have a relationship, like, so, so let's say that this situation happens and you have a relationship with the owner of the dog, like Charles. Here comes Charles with this ferocious animal. And you're like, hey, 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 Charles, Charles, Charles. What will happen? Charles will say, oh, hey, Muhammad, and we will pull the dog back. <laughs> the dhikr of Allah is talking to the owner. The dhikr of Allah is talking to the owner because your mind is the ferocious dog. Your mind is the ferocious dog. And we don't even know its owner. So we're just stuck. <laughs> we're just stuck in ourselves. So uh, I've been given the thumbs up, which I think indicates time's up. So no, it doesn't indicate time's up. I'll okay. Just, I'll be honest. I've got the room till <laughs> another half an hour, so you can open it up. Yeah. You just maybe keep the questions brief. I have formally opened it up. <laughs> But I'm sure, like, we've, anyway, we've just been talking forever anyway, so we'll continue right back and forth. <laughs> I think it was quite, it's, you've kept it quite open yeah. all day, so we've done. Yeah. Does yeah. there anything yeah. remaining? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, the, because the subject of the Holocaust came up, yeah. and uh, quite a lot of the people who were um, victims, they were innocent people. Mm -hmm. And yes, one could say, we, it's when people moved away from the true knowledge, the connection with God, that have these things happened. But the people who are victims of these kind of um, events, lots is going on in the world today, in the Middle East, everywhere, so much of the disaster, and food. So, um, takes away, it, it's very difficult to understand why that's happening. Condition of the human mind, just that's your answer. Yeah, what you're saying is basically like, look, you know, these things, these, you're asking about why do evil things happen to good people? And you, you started off by saying that, the first, you know, uh, it's because of the person's going away from God that they're being sort of sub subjected to things that they don't like, and, and I think that's not really true. In the Quran it says very clearly that on, on one hand you, di you don't, you're not, you will not be quick to detest that beyond your endurance. No, what I'm saying is that and there's... also that um, all the good things come from Allah and all the bad things come from you. Yeah, but it says in an, an, an ayah, literally one ayah before that, that everything comes from Allah. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, so it's not, look, the, the, the thing is this, this is part of our problem is that we have these, these suppositions that are in place, these, uh, these givens that are in place that really aren't givens, given. So for example, 
Is it the case that the sign of proximity to God is that someone doesn't have any problems in their life? No. Yes or no? No. Well, Pharaoh, for example, in the Quran is not, Pharaoh is a villainous creature in the Quran. He's seen as a villain. He, he never had even so much as a common cold in his life. Was he close to God? No. Not in the Quran, he wasn't. Okay. Well, every single one of the prophets were tried. We see their trials in the Qur'an in ways that most of us wouldn't be able to bear. Ibrahim alayhi salam was asked to sacrifice his own son. Nuh alayhi salam saw his son drowned. Lut alayhi salam lost his wife. These are all beloved people to a person. But no one would say any of those people were distant from God. So as a matter of fact, having trials and tribulations in your life is a proof that you actually are close to God. And if you don't have those trials and tribulations in your life, you start to wonder, am I close or not? So if being tried and going through difficulties and troubles is an indication that someone is close to God, well then maybe the Jews and the Holocaust needs to be reviewed in a different way. But then it also puts the image of God as someone who uses suffering as a means to find the unity of God. Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if pure happiness is what leads you to God all the time instead of suffering? Yeah, but here's the there's two things with what you said. You said that it makes God look like someone. God's not a person. Yeah. Second thing is that happiness is not the goal. Because if happiness was the goal, and we're in this world, show me where happiness is. How long does it last? How long does it last? No, I use the wrong word. Okay. Peace. Where do you find, where is peace a consistent entity in this world? In a, in a kitchen. <laughs> you know, you make your peace for your going to dinner, for your lunch. Well, you make your peace. No, really, let's start talking about, these are, these are certain yeah. ideals that I think we need to, to look at. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen permanence in this world? The only thing that's permanent about this world is a lack of permanence, which is a funny paradox. Mm -hmm. You do not find permanence anywhere in this world. Hmm. What are we all looking for in this world? Permanence. Permanence. When you have money, how long do you want to have it for? Permanently. When you have happiness, how long do you want to have it for? Permanently. When you are in love, how long do you want that to last for? Oh, forever and ever. <laughs> but, no, wait, here's the, here's the question though. Let's just say for a second, for the sake of argumentation, sake of having a laugh, let's just say, you know what? I'm not going to base my life upon pipe dreams. I don't know anything about this hereafter stuff, God, all this kind of stuff. All I know is, hey, here we are, this is life, and when we die, who knows? Let's just say that that's the way that things are. Okay, no problem. But I have a question if we do that. Because if we're going to make the criteria only be what our life is and what we experience in life to be the truth or what is worth living for, and it's true that every one of us is trying to find permanence. If it's happiness, we want permanent happiness. If it's peace, we want permanent peace. If it's love, permanent love. If there is no such thing, if, if all we have is this world and our experience, what we can say for sure is that we don't know if this world is here forever or not, but we can say that I'm not here forever. I've never seen permanence before. I don't know where it lives. In order for permanence to, be a, in order for permanence to actually be something verifiable for that kind of person, you've got to be able to show me where it's empirical. You've got to show me where it lives. Where does permanence live? <laughs> Oh no, it's, no, it does. Permanence lives in Edinburgh. It's, uh, it's near the library. You know that one street? No, because I don't come from Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you didn't, it'd be hard fetched to find where permanence lives. Now, if we can't vouch for permanence, but everyone in the universe is looking for permanence, if you're a Buddhist, what are you looking for? Enlightenment. Enlightenment, for how long? After For how long? Thank you, which is called permanence. Mm -hmm. If you're an atheist, what are you looking for? No. <laughs> Not God. For how long? <laughs> no, obviously their lives are more involved than that. Yeah. 
Everyone on the planet is looking for permanence, no matter what their preoccupation is, or whatever, whether they're into it or they're not into, because if you like something, you want it to be forever. Now, what we've said is that if there is no hereafter, if all we have is this world, you cannot explain where in the world this comes from. That leaves one of two possibilities. Either human beings are insane, which is fine, if we're all insane, then forget about it, do whatever you want. Or we know permanence. But we, knew, but we knew permanence before we got into this world. Which means we had a life before this world. And we knew permanence in that world. Otherwise you can't explain, for example, like, why does, why does your son, this little guy, not even three years old, Allah bless him, why, is he, why does he want to have a good time all the time? Where is it coming from? Does he know the word permanence? Have you taught him, Ibrahim, what you're doing now is looking for permanence. It's not something you teach him, it's an inborn trait. He knows it already. He knows permanence already. Unfortunately, he gets here and isn't, he, he, where to go? So we spend our lives looking for permanence. Right? So what you were saying in the beginning about, you know, what God does and what God doesn't do with us, in my humble opinion, which it doesn't seem to be so humble at the moment, it's that, wait a minute, look at the framework of the question. Number one, God is not a someone. He's above and beyond the limitations of any someone or person or limitation itself. And number two, the goal is not happiness. The goal is not peace. Because if you have them for a moment, that's not the goal. The goal is permanence. And what is permanence at the end of the day? What is always and forever? You know the answer. God. God. So what do people really want? God. They want God. That's what people want. They just don't realize it. I, I was raised as a, you know, I was raised in a, in, a, in a Christian tradition, and I'll tell you something I didn't want. I didn't want that, I didn't want that thing that was in the heavens with his finger waiting to shoot me down. It's not what I really wanted. You know, I'm not saying that that's the correct interpretation or not. I just know that as a kid, that's what I was told, and I didn't want it. And if you're going to make God, or if you're going to make Allah like that to me as well, I don't want it. I want that thing that is there always and forever. You know, and so, what, what, what people want, really, if you look at all the traditions, what they want is permanence. Yet how many of them are able to describe permanence accurately? Because once you start to limit permanence to any particular form, it's not permanent anymore. It's not always anymore. This is why the Muslims have such a problem with idolatry and these kinds of things, because it's, you've, you've already ruined it. It's not permanent. It's not always. If, those, if that thing has parts, it had, to, it had to have been put together at some point. And it's always subject to coming apart, too. That's not permanent. What we are offered is permanence in the hereafter. Hmm? We are offered the permanence in the, the hereafter. hereafter. Mm -hmm. There. That's why in paradise it says, Khalidina fiha abada, we will be there forever, and that's the reward. <coughs> but even paradise is, it, par paradise is not forever unless Allah wants it to be. So what is it, what is it that we really want then? It's not paradise. I think what we really want is the experience of And this is what I'm connecting with what you're saying. The paradise itself is not essentially permanent by its own. There has to be something there that causes it to be permanent. So what we really want is not paradise, but the creator of paradise even. It's what we want. We're doing it every single day of our lives, man. Every day of our life is a testimony to what we really want. May Allah give us Allah. You know, may He give us what we want. We want God. But shit happens to quote an eminent lama of my acquaintance. That was one of his quotes. Shit happens. Yeah. I mean, and that doesn't matter. Um, no, he was a very holy man. But I mean, he put things down on the floor. It happens and it Do you know why these things happen? Do you know, do you know why these things happen? Because... Make wrong choices. No. The reason why the things happen the way they happen is because I have to get from here to here. I have to get... I'm, 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 I'm traveling. I'm a traveler. Mm -hmm. I'm moving. I have to get somewhere. The reason why things happen the way they happen is because I have to get, in other words, 
Do we see God amongst us pushing things around? No. But we, we see the result of His order. Like, why did I get off that table? Uh, I wasn't on the table. Why did I get off the chair and come over here? Why? Oh, because I wanted to. That's not why. Because that was God's command. And how do I know? Because it already happened. So here I am. I've just been moved. Who moved me? God. I can't move myself. So here I am. Moving along, moving along, moving along, moving along. Do I call that a good? Do I call that a good or a bad? Well, depending on, we don't know. Look, okay. That's a good. If I get up out of the chair and I come over here, then I trip and I fall back and I pass out here. Is that a good or a bad? Looks kind of not good. But um, I have a concussion and I have to get up, I have to go to the hospital. When I get to the hospital, uh, I meet a fellow patient who is looking for a religion. We start talking, you know, and from my perspective, it's a good thing they, they become Muslim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, was that a bad or a good? That was a good thing to happen. Now, the whole time I'm being pushed along I have, until I get to, my, to the day that I die. That's right. Again, we have no idea what is good or bad for us. We have no idea. We can't say. All we have is our emotions and what we feel from our limited perspective. But we don't know. We don't know. And I'll tell you one thing. I know that God is not a tyrant. I know that God is, I know that God can't harm me. How do I know this? Tell me a reason why I would harm somebody else. Fear. Okay. Self. Self. Defense. Defense. Anger. Anger. Tell me more. Why would I hurt someone? Revenge. Why wow, you guys are jealousy. I could go on and on. Jealousy. I'm like, man, I hope they do anything to anybody. <laughs> the Scottish, you guys are much more like Because they're getting you road. Huh? Because his cars cut you up, that's why. Road rage. Road rage. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Do you drive? <coughs> Let me know when you're leaving. Yeah, that's a, uh, any, anyone else? Maybe that's the way it was meant to be. Yes, no problem. But look, I'm, I don't, I'm looking for something more tangible. Look, what do all these things have in common? Not just emotions, ego. not just ego. That you were made, it was you out of your it. control. It was out of you, you have to mm. 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 well, Look at it, be really real it's with yourself. God put it there. No, I'm asking about you. I bet no. You! Be well. Huh? Be well. Be well. Free will? No, something more basic. You're trying to get You want, who said that? Right, then, then. That's a high five, easy to know. Look, in each one of these instances, you're showing your deficiency. Yeah, yeah. You're afraid. Yeah. Deficiency. Yeah. Defense, it's a deficiency. Anger, it's a deficiency. Uh -huh. Revenge, deficiency. Yeah. Jealousy, deficiency. Road rage, deficiency. Why? Because if everything was cool, if you weren't missing anything, you wouldn't need to be afraid. Yeah. What, do you, what happens when you're afraid? You're missing what? Security. When you're defensive, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you missing? Safety. When you're angry, what are you missing? Emotions. Calmness. When, you're, when, you want, when you want to have revenge on someone, what are you missing? Justice. Justice. When you're jealous, what are you missing? Whatever attribute that they, that, you, that they see in them that you don't think that you have. When you have road rage, what are you missing? The other person's head. A gun to do it with. Yeah, a gun to do it with. Okay. These are deficiencies. God is, a, God is not, even, not even efficient. He's beyond efficiency. So categorically speaking, God is not subject to any of these things. He can't, in other words, God doesn't harm you. We harm ourselves. Don't, no, but this is really important. This is why we keep making God into a person. He doesn't harm us. That's not what happens. He pushes us along to get to where we have to go. Our problem is that we make God into a man. That's the problem. And this is because we don't know Him. You know how you said He pushes us? Where is free will? Where is free will on that? You know, free will, I love this one. You know, you know what the reality of free will is? What the reality of free will is? The reality of free will is the freedom to not to choose. 
Well, say it again. Free will is the freedom to not to choose. The freedom to that, the reality, the, the real meaning, the actual benefit behind free will is the freedom to not to choose. Otherwise, what good is it for anybody? Yeah. If you're not going to use it, if you're not going to use your free will for submission to God, why, why even talk about it? You're like sheep for whatever's going around at the time. Yeah. Find this. Anyway, there's much more to be said. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I'm saying that there's three things. Deen is three things. Islam, Iman, Ihsan. I'm saying that we need to be Muslims. And Muslims, our Deen is three things. We know about the body, but we don't know about the mind, and we don't know about the soul. So I'm saying that we need, we need to be it's not, it's, not, it's not as simple as, oh, yeah, just get some different moments in your life. No, it means no, have knowledge, know your deen, Whole, holistically speaking, so that your body and your mind and your soul are all participating in God's presence. Just one more comment. You say um, God, we, we perceive God as a man, as a man, right? Some people. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have a statement on that. When God made man, he was only practicing. He made women then. It's just better. <laughs> I'm just being flippant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. God's like, eh, try this one instead. Yeah, that's right. Now we need, we need a better model. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Cool. Well, sorry, I, I know that we could probably go on for quite a while longer, but as I said. Thank <laughs> يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا أرحم الراحمين يا ذا القوة المتين يا خالق يا خالق سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نصرك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام بالسر الذي وبينك وبينه صلى الله عليه وسلم أن توافقنا فيما يرضاك في الدنيا وفي الآخرة يا أرحم الراحمين نسألك أن نجعلنا من العارفين المقبولين المهديين المسلمين نسألك يا الله على حسن الختام بلا إله إلا الله سيدنا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا الله we ask you that you give us توفيق يا الله that you give us the ability to meet you where you want us to meet you and that we live our life in the way that makes you pleased and that as a, as a uh, based upon the secret that's between you and the Prophet that you cause us to know you and you cause us to be accepted by you and that you cause us to be guided and you cause us to be amongst the Muslims those people who die la ilaha illallah that there's no God but you and that Muhammad is upon him as your messenger and if we're not like that now we ask you, Ya Allah, on your mercy, that you make us that way. And if there's something else written for us in any kind of way, we ask you, Ya Allah, that you erase that and you erase a good ending for us, an ending that would please the Prophet, as a favor to the Prophet, not based upon something that is good for us or not good for us. You love him, and we ask you, Ya Allah, by that love you have for him, that when we meet him on that day, that we'll meet him in a way that he's pleased with us, so that, that way, we're pleasing to you. Allah, we might fall short when it comes to you, but your Prophet spent his entire life to make sure that we were guided. So we ask you, Allah, as a favor to him, peace be upon him, that we have a good ending, and that ultimately we accept it by you, Ya Adun Jalali wa Dikram. La ilaha ila anta subhanaka inna kunna minu dhanimeen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatihin. Ma'ubrika wa khatimini ma'asabah. 
ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله عن قدره ومقداره العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة